Shopping addiction is a very real problem that many people in this community have faced or are currently facing. Over the course of my time online, I've been hesitant to call myself addicted or having previously been addicted. And part of that is because for a long time, I never really saw myself that way. Even when I went on my no buy in 2020, I saw certain behaviors as problematic and, you know, not saving any money is a problematic behavior when you want to save up for retirement or, you know, other things. And so that's a problematic behavior that isn't inherently in and of itself indicative of shopping addiction. And this is generally true where you can participate in problematic shopping behaviors or problematic behaviors, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem, let alone an addiction. And it's really only in hindsight and moving through those problematic behaviors that I really began to see how I was shopping previously, the outlook I had on stuff, and ultimately the behaviors I had as problems. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about shopping addiction, but we're largely going to do that through something called the Bergen Shopping Addiction Scale. I mentioned it in a previous video very briefly, and we're going to talk more about what it is today. And before we do that, before we even get there, number one, if this kind of discussion is going to be triggering to you, please skip out, don't watch, you know, you don't have to be here and take care of yourself. But number two, that this is in no way an attempt to diagnose you with anything. I'm largely coming through my perspective today with my own experience, as well as looking at what some of the available research says, including the creators of the scale. So I am going to talk about the scale uh, today, and I'm also going to take the test uh, because the I'm just going to call it the Bergen scale for the rest of this video. The Bergen scale was created to be taken in like clinical professional settings, but also it's supposed to be self-administered even in those settings. And this is really an opportunity, or I want to use this as an opportunity to talk about shopping addiction and as well as a reflection of my own experience. In many cases, hearing people talk about their own experiences is helpful and can sometimes like you might see something objectively online or you might see the scale or you might read articles about it. But sometimes the most helpful thing is to hear from somebody else. And I also think that the more that people talk about these things and the more open that they are, the more dialogue that is created. And then the more or maybe like destigmatized or the more or perhaps the less shame or embarrassment Uh, that can circle around these topics. In 2024, the lines of shopping addiction, I think, are much more blurred than they ever have been before. And that's simply because the idea of what is normal consumption is just at much higher rates than it was 20, 30, or 40 years ago. People are overall purchasing more at least in the North American context where I live, they're purchasing more than they ever have. People are owning more things. They're owning them for less. And also standards of living have overall increased over the past 30 years. Even something like computers and cell phones, which just when we think about now compared to the mid nineties are much more prevalent Um, you know, one house might have had a computer in the mid nineties, if at all using dial up. And now people have multiple computers. It's almost like one computer per person. This shifting idea of normal has, I think, shifted people's perspectives of the problem or when something might be a problem. And If you are somebody who is online, I do think that online behavior is normal for online, but not necessarily normal for the average person. And so if you find yourself watching stuff online, any kind of haul content or any kind of really influencer content, that can be seen as normal. And then when you compare your life to theirs, you could say, well, do I really have a problem if my consumption doesn't look like theirs? 
or if I'm consuming less than they are. Or if that's normal and I'm consuming less, then like, do I really have a problem? And when it comes to overconsumption as well, you can participate in overconsumption and promote it while also having a shopping problem, but also you don't have to have a shopping problem in order to participate in overconsumption. What I'm trying to say is that overconsumption isn't inherently indicative of a shopping problem because I think shopping addiction's central concerns isn't inherently overconsumption. Overconsumption can be a symptom of a larger problem. According to Zarate et al., there are concerns about overpathologizing common behaviors like work, exercise, or sex because problematic behaviors are likely to manifest when individuals engage in subjectively enjoyable activities. So as I was saying, somebody can participate in problematic behaviors without having a problem or an addiction. And one of the factors I think, or one of the things that can maybe help somebody decide is whether or not this behavior or this problem is impairing their life. I think this matters if we are comparing our lives to other people, because I, like when I think about myself, my shopping habits for makeup and clothes were perhaps at the time a little bit more than my peers, but not as bad as what I was seeing online. But you can have a problem at any income level or any kind of level of acquisition. You don't have to be bringing in Hermes bags or thousands of dollars of stuff a week to have a problem that impairs your life. And I think that's one of the interesting things about people sharing their experiences online is that that act showcases a wide variety of people who are like who've experienced the problem in different ways. Like at most, I think I own maybe like 20, 25 foundations at my peak. I think my peak lipstick ownership was something like 200 lipsticks. Some people would say that's overconsumption. Some people would say, oh, that's probably, that person probably has a problem. Some people might say, oh, that doesn't seem that bad. You know, like, and if I listened to those other voices of people who've been like, oh, that's not that bad, I probably would have kept going, but there was something in the back of my mind that was like, this doesn't feel right. Over the past 15 or so years, there has been an increasing awareness in behavioral addictions, which, you know, has included shopping and shopping addiction isn't a recognized addiction in the DSM as well as other similar manuals. And there is still disagreement as to whether shop, like a shopping problem is actually an addiction. And if it is an addiction, like what are the thresholds of that? What does that look like? There's a lack of consistency surrounding the recognition of problematic shopping behavior as a formal diagnosis, which has raised questions concerning prevalence rates and individual differences. This lack of consensus has really led to different ways of thinking about it or pathologizing it as well as different ways to measure it. When you get into the research about problematic shopping behaviors, there isn't even like a, a set name. I feel like right now shopping addiction is probably the leading one, but there's other, there've been other names like problematic shopping behavior or PSB, sometimes compulsive shopping. And you know, there have been other ones and even the rates of occurrences have shifted dramatically or been reported between 1% and 20% because of how people think about and measure it. The most common reference is just shy of 6%. Uh, that's the one that people kind of feel like holds the most water. But even then, there I think is still doubt about whether that reflects reality uh, based on like who is being measured, how they're being measured, and you know, where they're being measured in other kinds of, of contexts. And this, this roughly 6% is a number that came out in the early 2000s. And so people are kind of saying that this is a bit out of date and there have been measurements since, but it's kind of hard to say whether it's 6%, 10%, 2% or 20% because of a bit of what I've mentioned. So this disagreement about how to measure what constitutes a shopping problem has been debated since about the 80s. And one of the reasons why like 
saying that the rate of occurrence is a bit difficult can come down to how people are being measured, which is the whole point of why the Bergen scale was developed. Because in older scales, questions like Questions would refer to writing checks as an example or entering shopping centers. And many of the skills developed in the 80s, 90s, even into the early 2000s had no mention of online shopping or just couldn't or wouldn't be applicable to online shopping. So if I were to ask you about how it feels to write a check, I have never written a check because I've I think I was asked maybe once or twice, and I just found ways to get out of it. A central aspect of the debate over what a shopping problem is, is whether it represents an impulse control, obsessive, compulsive, or addictive disorder. In 2015, Anderson et al. argued that those with problematic shopping behaviors report specific addiction symptoms, such as craving withdrawal, loss of control, and tolerance. Research has also linked those with problematic shopping to individual characteristics typical to other addictive behaviors. This has kind of been the belief that has like emerged as the most prominent over the last 10 to 15 years and understand that all are the creators of the Bergen scale. And one of the reasons why they created the scale is to reflect this changing paradigm. And so not only do some of these older scales feel out of date, um, which does matter. Some of because these older skills just aren't applicable to the modern context. And you don't necessarily have to be asked a question about being online in specific, but the questions still have to be applicable to that usage or that kind of modernized take on shopping or modernized use of, of shopping. If you're not writing checks or you're not entering malls, some people could just be doing it 100% online. And so how we measure things do need to reflect how people are actually shopping. And so back to the check example, somebody 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they might have really enjoyed or had a thrill writing a check. Or perhaps when we're thinking about ideas of financial strain, they might wonder if their checks would bounce. And so that could cause anxiety or distress. So thinking about technology and how that modulates behavior has been um, an important question in this field. There have actually been really interesting articles coming out of the last five to 10 years that have considered online shopping and how the internet has fundamentally changed how people think or shop. And also if it has escalated problems or constitutes separate problems. Like some people have been wondering whether online shopping addiction should be considered separate from just shopping addiction. And also ideas about whether the online age or more like social media age has escalated or promoted more problematic behaviors. So perhaps somebody might ordinarily have spent $200 those people are now spending $1,000 because social media has really just created access to shopping that wasn't possible 20 years ago. Although there have been more modern skills developed in the last 10 to 15 years, they don't all address shopping through the framework of addiction. And the creators of the Perkins scale have said that they don't address uh, the core addiction criteria, which are salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict, relapse, and resulting problems, which these are things that have been emphasized in several behavioral addictions. And the Bergen scale has really been a champion of the addiction model, which has, I think, made them so popular. So what even is the Bergen scale? So the scale is a self-rating questionnaire, meaning that an individual would go and use the questionnaire and they would rate themselves from the strongly disagreed, strongly agreed. It's one of those scales where the participant rates themselves. It's a 28 question questionnaire that is designed to tackle all seven of the areas of addiction. It wasn't created specifically for online shopping, but it was made intentionally to be applicable to that context. When we go over the questions, you will see that it's not physical or online specific. It's also this flexibility that has made it popular, I think. There are shorter versions, like there's a seven question version. We're looking at the 28 version because that's like the classic. And the 28 version has four questions that look at 
each of the seven um, addiction criteria. 2015, you know, was nine years ago. So enough time has passed to vet this model. And quite frankly, if there are more like nuanced models that come to the fore or ones that replace this, I am all for that. I am all for, you know, developing criteria that is going to be the most helpful. So I'm not like, I don't have a particular like love of this or some kind of desire for this to like reign supreme. This to my knowledge is just the most popular, widely used model. Um, is also used in clinical settings and has also been vetted. And in 2016, somebody tried to create an online model for this, basically um, to be like explicitly about online shopping. And it was found to largely be unnecessary like when studied further. The direct quote is that given that the Bergen scale was specifically developed to take into account the different ways in which people now shop to include both online and offline shopping, there does not seem to be a good rationale for developing an online version. The first long-term study on the Bergen scale actually came out in August of 2024, like literally three or four weeks ago. So they tracked a group of just under 300 adults over two years. The study highlights that the Bergen scale scores over two years are not co-founded by biases related to scaling and measurement issues, and therefore can be justifiably used to monitor developmental changes of shopping addiction symptoms and clinical treatment effects over time. We're now getting into the testing portion of this video, and I am not a doctor, clinician, physician, behavioral scientist, so, you know, my opinion only holds so much weight. I know that there are people who are not a fan of, like, at-home testing because people can take tests in a situation or circumstance, which they perhaps shouldn't, take a test that might not reflect the reality and then believe the results to be true of them, walk around thinking that they have shopping addiction or bipolar, maybe they can't afford treatment, maybe they can, maybe they never seek it out when those things aren't actually true about themselves. Other people really like them and appreciate them because they can give folks a jumping off point to go and seek help. I think that can be really powerful. I do urge you to apply caution when using these kinds of tests. And most especially if you are in an emotionally vulnerable position or you feel like taking a test like this would be distressing or perhaps not helpful at the moment, you know, uh, please don't do it. I am also taking the test out of context. So I am, or I guess I'm going to do it in, in two ways. So we're going to walk through the test and I'm going to be thinking about how things were like before I changed my shopping habits, kind of talking about that and, you know, putting in my answers of that timeline. You're supposed to be doing this uh, or assessing these statements as of the last 12 months. I will, once we go through, compare this to right now and we will kind of compare the scores and kind of see how things uh, might have changed. We're going to get started and question number one is shopping slash buying is the most important thing in my life. So I don't think it was the most important thing. I did know that like, well, there were more important things like people or school, like my career path. Um, those were more important, but it did take a lot of my time. So I'm going to go with a more neutral on this one. Number two, I think about shopping, buying things all the time. Completely agree. It took up a weird amount of time and energy and more so like thought processes late at night, in bed, in the, like in the morning, I would be like watching videos of things to buy, casually on breaks, looking up things to buy. It would fill all the time that I would let it fill. Oh, I spend a lot of time thinking of or planning shopping Yes. Tons of time there too. I would curate carts for hours. Thoughts about shopping, buying keep popping in my head. Yes. I would say this one is more of, I'm going to put agree instead of completely agree because I, I thought about it a lot, but I wouldn't be in the middle of class and then just like start thinking about shoes 
or I wouldn't like necessarily find the thoughts intrusive. Okay, number five, I shop in order to feel better. I think there should be a, a more stronger sentiment than completely agree. Probably one of my most harmful or destructive behaviors. Oh, I shop, um, buy things in order to change my mood. 100%. Oh, in order, I shop in order to forget about my personal problems. Yup. I shop in order to reduce feelings of guilt, anxiousness, loneliness, and or depression. Um, it's still an agree, but the other ones are more of what I was doing. And I also think that at the time I would have had a hard, like a harder time distinguishing, like changing my mood or feeling better from dealing with anxiousness or helplessness or loneliness or all of that kind of stuff. A lot of the time there'd be crossover. Like I would want to feel better or attempt to feel, to change my mood because it was shitty. Okay. Number nine, I buy so much that it negatively affects my daily obligations. No, I do feel like I maintained my daily obligations. I don't find that to be an issue or I didn't, sorry. I gave less priority to hobbies, leisure activities, job studies, or exercise because of shopping buying. I'm going to go with just agree on this one because I would go to work or school on time. That wasn't a problem. Or like I would arrive home on time from those things. I would go shopping after school and shopping was the hobby. And shopping did push out other things that could have been potential hobbies, but I did manage to maintain other things like working out for a few years, like before, during, and after. So it gets an agree, but not a strong agree. I've ignored people because of shopping buying. I disagree. I don't think I did that. I often ended up in arguments with other people because of buying. I'm going to give this one a neutral. <sighs> I did get into arguments mostly with my parents and I did feel like a sense of shame over that. And I often got more so comments about how much stuff I was buying. So, you know what, we'll go agree. But it was like just that I never really had conversations with other people or I can't actually recall any conversations with anybody else besides them. And I wouldn't also call them like intrusive or like I felt like I I did feel anxiousness when stuff arrived because I didn't want to have more of those conversations, but I didn't destroy relationships because of it, which I've heard has happened with other people. So we get an agree, I think. I wish there was like a, a more lighter agree because neither agree or disagree doesn't feel right here and agree feels a little too strongly, but we're going to go with agree. I feel an increasing inclination to shop, buy things that definitely happened over time to like eventually like the thing that went, oh, we got to do something about this was that I was spending more money because I was buying more stuff, which coincided with the increasing like desire to, you know, increasing the threshold because I didn't shop like that at the beginning. I shop slash buy much more than I had intended or planned. I I don't know exactly if I should answer this as a agree or completely agree because I often didn't intend to have a budget or make a plan. I just wanted to shop. And however it was, was however it was. Now, I think maybe we should do a completely agree because um, there would be times where I'd be like, wait, I spent how much on this? Um, or I would be surprised at how much I spent, right? Which to me, if it's like, oh, I'm surprised at how much I spent, there's that idea of like, oh, you spent too much. I feel I have to shop by more and more to obtain the same satisfaction as before. Yes, I'm going to do just agree on that one. I feel I have to shop more and I spend more and more time shopping. It definitely increased in the end. I think the money increased more than the time because I would like in the last two years, I would 
spend quite a bit of time. Near the end, I would buy more things. So I, I think that also lends more credence to the I bought more than I had intended. I have tried to cut down on shopping buying without success. Okay. This is another interesting one because I did do a no buy year and that was the one and only time I ever attempted to reduce how much I was spending. I never really made promises to myself beforehand of like, I'm going to do it and then not follow through. However, I was, I consider my no buy successful because I completed the year, even though there were mistakes, but I can acknowledge that I did buy things during my year that I shouldn't have, um, including like some books as well as I bought some clothes in April of that year and I ended up returning them, but I like, just like, I literally couldn't do it, but I feel like that gets a degree. If I truly could not go more than a few months without buying something, I've been told by others to reduce. Yes. And I didn't listen to them. I have decided to shop by less, but have not been able to do so. I'm going to, I'm hoping this maybe like modulates a little bit. I'm going to kind of give that one a, a medium amount because I was able to stop for periods. I have managed to limit shopping, buying for a period and then experience retail relapse. I'm going to say completely agree because I did buy things after my no buy year and, and I, I went on periods where I told myself I wouldn't, but was not able to continue And I think there was more experiences of relapse in 2021 than I cared to admit at the time. 100% bought a bunch of clothes that year when I totally shouldn't have. I become stressed if obstructed from shopping, buying things. Absolutely. I become sour and grumpy if I can't buy things when I feel like it. Absolutely. I feel bad if I, for some reason, am prevented from shopping or buying things. Yes. All of these... Um, I become stressed. I know now that it was how I coped with stress. And if I couldn't shop when I was stressed, um, it until like 2023, I wasn't actually able to not shop if I was stressed. That I feel bad if I'm prevented from buying stuff. I usually had the stronger reaction if I was like feeling some kind of stress. And for many things, I could hold off for a little while, but like eventually it would lead to some stress. If there has been a while since I last shopped, I feel a strong urge to shop by things. Yes. I shop by so much that it has caused economic problems. As I mentioned, that was the main reason why I decided to, as I mentioned, that was the big impetus for changing. I shop by so much that it has impaired my well-being. Absolutely. Holy moly. That was a huge factor as well. I've worried so much about my shopping that it has sometimes has me sleepless. I would disagree. I didn't worry about it until after I started changing because I didn't really feel like there was a problem and I loved the way that I shop. The last one is being bothered with a poor conscience of, uh, because of buying shopping. Yes, big time. Okay. My final score was five out of a possible seven with 88 out of a possible 112 um, of a score. So our scores in the range of a four to seven are indicative of shopping addiction. Now compare the five out of seven or the 88 of 112 with my current score, which is zero or 21 out of a possible 112. One of the questions I still selected agree for is number three, which is I spend a lot of time, you know, thinking of our planning uh, around shopping and I still do derive some pleasure from shopping. Like, no, that still remains to be true. I am just doing the whole planning uh, much less. If I am spending time, uh, it usually doesn't actually lead to a purchase. I'm just much more cognizant of how I spend my time, like how much of it and when. 
and um, all of that. But I do still like talking about it. My best friend and I, we talk about stuff that we like and want all the time. And so I do acknowledge I'm still finding pleasure in shopping. Just it like can't and won't be a hobby for me anymore. You know, shopping used to be a hobby for me, as I indicated previously. And ever since stopping, I intentionally, you know, I had a void that I intentionally filled with other hobbies that I find way more fulfilling. I think that was the only thing that I selected agree for. There's a few that I selected the kind of neutral. I view it more as neutral now. Um, and one of those has, one of those was, if there's been a while since I last shopped, I feel a strong urge to buy things. I put neutral in that because I can feel an itch to buy things after a few weeks or like a few months. Um, but that doesn't always lead to a purchase or I can, um, modulate things like intentionally. I also selected the neutral category for um, some of the emotional ones. Like I buy things or shop in order to change my mood. One thing I've still caught myself doing from time to time is going to a website when I'm feeling down or like, you know, just having a, a strong emotional moment and like looking for things to buy. Since I attempted to change this behavior beginning in 2023. This has never resulted in a purchase because I am cognizant of it and I will like catch myself and, you know, to redirect my behavior, but I have still found myself going there sometimes like without even thinking. Um, I did this a little while ago, like a few weeks ago and then switched to uh, reading instead after a little bit. So there are still some of those pulls that remain. I'm just not actually pulling the trigger. So that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed hearing my take on the Bergen scale and reflecting a little bit more about my own experience. So thank you so much for watching and being here today. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to watch my content. And I hope to see you again around here soon. Bye. Take